about the beautiful and tranquil rural landscape of Wales. But let's time travel back 30 years. Tregaron in West Wales may have looked the same, but this was a very different world. Nineteen seventy seven, and the whole of Britain, it seemed, was celebrating the Queen's Silver Jubilee. But it was another event that was making headline news in Wales. Operation Jubilee to me was the biggest story I, I've ever worked on. At the time, it was massive. Massive was no understatement. Operation Julie was to become the biggest police undercover operation in history. It obviously took out some 90% of the British market of LSD. And all this was happening as the UK pogo to the Sex Pistols boogied the night to Saturday Night Fever and George Lucas took us to a galaxy far, far away. But it was down to sleepy West Wales to really shock the nation. I actually felt sort of dismayed that I knew nothing about it. I mean, I was trying to be the biggest dope dealer in the world. We've never come over it in, in Santa Brother. We've been scarred ever since. This is a story of a secret operation based in rural West Wales in a period of huge cultural change. At that time, uh, well, particularly the 60s rather than the 70s, there was a fear of uh, world wars. You know, I mean, there was possibly you know, people were talking about uh, what had happened, and there were CMT marches. There was a lot of fear of the world being destroyed by its own inhabitants. So a counterculture developed, well, you know, this would be one way of stopping all this nonsense, just let them all take acid. LSD is a hallucinogenic drug, basically lysergic acid, diethyl amide, if you want the full name, but basically it's a drug that uh, causes you to hallucinate. You see things that you don't usually see, you hear things you don't usually hear, and you also have some weird ideas that you think you can fly, for instance. And over the years, several people have lost their lives through thinking they can, in fact, fly, and have jumped off tall buildings. Well, you're always aware with uh, LSD that these hallucinations are, as a result of taking LSD, whereas some of the stronger drugs, like DMT, um, you aren't aware, you're, you're apologise to the dragons for disturbing them. <laughs> There was a cultural change happening in Wales, too. The drug LSD had found its way to the remotest parts of the country. There was an influx of newcomers, from those in search of idyllic peace to those who wanted an alternative lifestyle. The hippies' mantra was, turn on, tune in, drop out. Back in the 70s, Lynn Ebenezer was a reporter at the popular weekly newspaper, The Cambrian News, and he remembers the time well. But this was, was a period when there was a big influx of hippies and semi-hippies, if you like. Some of those regarded as hippies lived in, you know, houses, they had families. Uh, but they were very likeable, sociable people. Uh, the locals liked them. But there were so many of these people around. There's even talk of um, soccer match being played at Llanewy between two teams of hippies. Every member of the two sides were hippies. One such couple settled at Pentlaney Cottage in Tregaron, Richard Hilary Kemp and Christine Bott. He was a brilliant chemist and technician and became the driving force behind a Welsh LSD factory located at Plas Llysyn, a mansion owned by an American friend at Carnot, Mid Wales. Christine Bott was a firm believer that LSD could change society for the good and she and Kemp had been influenced by the teachings of Dr. Timothy Leary and the Brotherhood of Eternal Love. Local farmer Hugh Thomas remembers much of the goings-on at the mansion and met both Bott and Kemp. I met them about three or four times. Um, the type of people that kept themselves to themselves and uh, they were very intelligent people. Distribution of the LSD was the responsibility of Alston Frederick Hughes, known locally as Smiles, and his friend Paul Healy, called Buzz. They lived in Llandewi Brevi. They mixed with the locals, there's talk of them giving away bottles of whiskey to old people, lighting cigarettes with fivers. They got on well locally and that's why you won't hear a bad word about them. Uh, I've never heard anyone 
say anything bad about him, even though they were involved in LSD. They were not bank robbers or people like that, you know. People didn't look on them as crooks, as bad people. Let's talk about one of the Tanewi boys, uh, Smiles, taking a group of friends to the races. And there was a horse running there called Cannabis. And somebody shouted at one of the bookies, What price Cannabis? And Smiles said, Oh, in Tanewi, ten quid an ounce. There's another story about um, a local chap playing cards with Smiles and it got a bit late and he said, hey, what time is it? I've got to go home. And Smiles says, uh, haven't you got a watch? Said, no, have mine. Now they say it was a Rolex. I, I don't quite believe that, but he gave his watch away. Typical, you know. Money, money, money. Smiles could afford to be generous because the money was pouring in. At its peak, the LSD from Kano was supplying customers in two-thirds of the countries of the world. At some point, the drug has to be distributed, uh, and it's distributed um, by the standard methods of retail distribution, really, uh, you know, sort of wholesaling and splitting up into sort of smaller wholesaling and then into retail eventually, uh, with again a sort of lack of communication between the big wholesalers and the street dealers for obvious reasons. Something like about 100 countries were subjected to importation of, of microdons. A phenomenal in amount, you know, so there's tens of millions of pounds a year. The key to its success was its isolation, not simply being stuck in the middle of Wales and the West countryside, but also because of the discipline of the, of the personnel involved, which is, I suppose, a, a classic cellular structure thing, you know, which model you find in lots of organised crime and terrorism and anything like that. Uh, so that if one part of the organisation gets busted, the others can continue uh, unimpaired. To the locals, news of drug involvement came as a complete surprise. We didn't see anything wrong with him, and there was no talk about the drugs or anything in this area before this, that thing happened. But some did begin to get suspicious of their flamboyant behaviour. There were one or two signs of something odd going on, something illegal. In particular, I remember a friend of mine telling me that he was in this actual pub, the Talbot, one day when a fellow he vaguely knew put a whole doll, a bag, on the counter and said, look after this for me and I'll, I'll pay you. And we were talking big money, hundreds if not thousands. Uh, he was scared off, he thought perhaps it was something to do with the IRA. But um, another sign was the big spending going on uh, between these uh, people who were eventually charged, uh, they were spending a hell of a lot of money and people began thinking, where's this money coming from? The local David Powers constabulary became suspicious too. I was in charge of the David Powers drug squad and we used to work closely obviously with various other drug squads throughout the country, uh, particularly with the then detective inspector Dick Lee who was in charge of the Thames Valley drug squad. We obviously started discussing, as various drug squads do, about the availability of drugs, the prices of drugs, and it became apparent that at that particular time, LSD was available in our force area cheaper than it could be purchased in some of the cities in England. Dick Lee from Thames Valley Drug Squad asked David Powers Police to raid Alston Hughes' house in Llandewi Brevi. But on the day of the raid, Dick Lee was late and was desperate to get a message to Richie Parry and the boys. Foolishly, I'd say, he contacted the local police station in Flandewi Brevi and asked to speak to the local police officer. He was out, as it happens, with us, ready to go on the raid. As was the case in those days, the policeman's wife was more or less a secretary as well as the policeman's wife. She would answer the phone, she would take details if persons brought uh, documents in and she informed Dick Lee where her husband was. He got a bit irate and said he desperately needed to speak to us and thinking she was doing us a favour and him a favour, she goes down to the Glen, which is Hughes' home, knocks on the door prior to us arriving and asks Hughes, oh, is my husband here? Before we then arrive at the premises, Hughes has had an opportunity to get rid of any drugs that would have been in there. This incident was to trigger the start of ongoing discussions that would lead to the biggest drugs bust in history. Various names were banded about and at that time Dick Lee 
wanted to know if we had ever heard or come across a doctor by the name of Kemp, Richard Hillary Kemp. Kemp owned a red Range Rover. He'd already been involved in a few accidents, but this time he was involved in a fatal accident on the road between Aberystwyth and Machenlleth. And I happened to be covering the inquest, and unwittingly, I was witnessing history being made. Kemp's name was already on the police files. They were watching him. Following the crash, Kemp's car was searched thoroughly, and although no drugs were found, the police did find six pieces of paper, which when put together, spelt the words hydrazine hydrate, a key ingredient in the manufacture of LSD. For the first time, they had something tangible to work on. So the net was closing. This prompted the establishment of Britain's first ever combined drug busting operation led by Dick Lee. Officers were hand picked from various forces, including David Powis. It was uh, about lunchtime on uh, a day in April of 1976, and the detective inspector came to see me in the office in the police station in Llanelli. And he simply said, Die, you're going on a course on Monday uh, to devises and uh, chances are that you'll be away from home for about six weeks afterwards. At Devizes in Wiltshire, disbelieving officers were told of their task and promptly sent undercover. Before deployment of any undercover officers, a cover story has obviously got to be set up with their background, etc. And depending on how long you intend leaving them in as undercover officers, this will depend on the cover story. And on this particular instance, the cover story was only capable of lasting a couple of weeks. But when it was expected for them to stay in for month after month, they had to change their cover story as they were going along, which isn't good practice at all. The undercover policemen were treated rather suspiciously, as were any strangers who kept to themselves. And these people, apparently they tried to pass themselves off, first of all, as bird watchers. And then the locals said, ah, no, there's something more to this. There's no women here. These are homosexuals. It's a bit weird when you see two chaps coming down together all the time, and uh, you take it there a bit the other way. <laughs> what they did, they drafted in some women constables, including Julie Taylor, who then gave a name to the whole operation. The police noticed that Kemp was making increasingly frequent visits from his base at Pentlainai Cottage in Tregaron to Pla Schlesin, 50 miles down the road in Carno, the mansion owned by his American friend. Di Reese was sent on a mission. We were given the task of keeping 24-hour surveillance on the mansion. We had acquired an old caravan and the caravan was parked right at the entrance to the driveway leading down to Place Lesson. We had a very good view to monitor the arrivals and departures of people to the mansion. I may remember the caravan, but I made nothing of it because there was a, they were constructing a bridge in, next door to here, and uh, they were using the yard and everything as a... As a well, uh, as a site. One morning, a lady came to a caravan, totally out of the blue, and she left a little piece of paper, and all she said was, uh, on this paper was, uh, the American is off to Spain today. Di contacted base and spoke to Dick Lee. As the mansion was empty, Lee instructed the officers to break in. Well, we were very, very inept burglars, I can assure you. We eventually managed to get in through a window at the back of the house, having first removed the back door, only to be frightened off by a sheet of zinc flying around in the, in the roof space. The officers made their way down to the cellar, and although it was empty, they took some samples of water from the drains and underneath the floorboards. These it soon became obvious that I think it was something like 90% of all LSD seized in the UK was from the same source. It was somewhere like 40 or 60% of the world market was also from the same source. It looked as if it was the Operation Julie source. This was the breakthrough Dick Lee had been waiting for. But Lee didn't want quick arrests. He wanted more. 
surveillance on Kemp and Bott's house was intensified. There was 24-hour monitoring by the police team working from Bronwith Cottage near Tregaron. Well, Bronwith wasn't the uh, ideal place for a stakeout because of the hill behind the house. And the police were anxious to uh, bug Pentlinae, but couldn't find a way in to do it when Kemp and Bott were away. You must remember it's back in the mid-70s, technology was nowhere near what it is today. Listening devices were approved to be installed at premises, including the one at Tregaron, but this involved not radio transmitters because there were no such devices to be had. It meant running a cable from the listening device up a hill, over a hill and to the other side where it could be monitored by officers from the Julie team. It worked well until the listening uh, policeman one day heard a very different kind of noise. There were Welsh hymn tunes coming over the uh, cable. Apparently a passing sheep had bitten through the cable and turned it into an aerial which picked up hymns of praise in Welsh. Various devices were being monitored um, on, on one particular one. Uh, it transpired that a meeting was due to take place between Hughes and Russell Stephen Spensley, who was also living in the David Powys area. It was believed that a handover was going to take place of either cash or drugs. Um, the details of the meet were very vague because it was only referred to as somewhere where an individual had got married with local knowledge and the assistance of persons we could trust in the area, members of the public, we identified the premises as the Ram Inn public house in Command Lampita. Officers were deployed to cover this meet and a handover did take place between Hughes and Spensley of a package which uh, later transpired to contain 50,000 LSD microdots. Now at that time the biggest seizure anywhere in the world of microdots was of 40,000. So this was a mammoth quantity never ever heard of anywhere in the world. The pressure was on. Should Dick Lee draw the inquiry to an end and take out the distribution network or go for the jugular, the LSD manufacturing as well? The police had become suspicious that a second drug making factory was producing LSD and sent for reinforcements. I was a police officer with the David Powers Police Drug Squad uh, stationed at Carmarthen. I was called into the Chief Constable's office and uh, said that I'd be going up to London on surveillance duties with the main team of Operation Julie. The team were based at RF Hendon. Uh, it was a four bedroom house and there was 14 of us staying there. Neuer and his team monitored the house at Seymour Road, Thames Ditton, London suspected HQ for the LSD factory run by Henry Barclay Todd. A driver used to drive the van in, he used to lock us in, and two persons were in the van. It was sweltering hot, uh, no mod cons at all, uh, just a porta potty in the corner, and of course we had flasks of tea, and uh, we couldn't leave the van at all until the driver returned to pick us up uh, that afternoon or that evening. To make matters worse, there was also the increasing paranoia that their cover was to be blown. There were people, nosy parkers, looking into the van and, and uh, keeping an eye on it. But in the van, we had a two-way uh, mirror there, so they couldn't see us in the back at all. But on one occasion, the team got seriously lucky. They were following one particular suspect, and obviously when you're carrying out surveillance, you've got two-way radios and you were transmitting to each other that the target is moving off and this particular individual he overheard a transmission I believe on his car radio or on some piece of equipment he immediately drove round the block thinking that he was being followed but fortunately there were some taxis or a taxi office and he fortunately put it down to that and didn't think he'd been blown but where were the drug-making factories getting their raw materials? Dye was sent on another secret mission to Yorkshire to monitor the goings-on at a glass-making factory. 
He posed as a customer, but on meeting the owner, his instincts as a policeman took over. At this point, there's something in the, uh, in a detective's head which says, you've got to take a chance here. And my assessment of this particular person was that he was a very, very honest John citizen. I took a chance and I said to this gentleman that I was a police officer, that I was making an investigation into a serious crime and that I had very good reason to believe that uh, he was being used to supply uh, apparatus for illegal purposes. Dai was convinced that the owner was indeed an honest John, but Dick Lee wasn't so sure. He said, Dai, if you have screwed this up, you know what's going to happen. And uh, I was able to reassure him that based on my personal professional judgment that here was a man that we could do business with and I suggested that he come along and see him himself. Luckily Lee was convinced and with the owner's approval secretly marked key utensils that were eventually used at the London LSD factory in Seymour Road. The police were now ready to raid. Operation Julie reached its climax in March 1977 after 13 months of undercover secrecy, the police raided 87 homes in England and Wales. The team now had been gathered at Aberystwyth at 4 o'clock in the morning. We'd all been informed that uh, what was going on. This time, the gang leaders were caught by surprise, and the police and Neuer Bowen uncovered valuable evidence. We were searching the outbuildings and... Uh, we were going along this, this small little stream and lo and behold I lifted a clump of grass which was across the stream and in there there was a package wrapped in polythene and uh, we took possession of it and brought it back to the house and saw then that it contained a lot of money. We came back to Aberystwyth, counted it all and it was £11,000 in cash and it was all the proceeds from selling LSD. Hidden beneath the manure heap in Kemp's garden, police found tableting equipment and pure LSD crystals were found nearby. On a return visit, more crystals were found at the house, enough to make up to 13 million pounds on the open market at the time. These were hidden underneath the living room floor. Over at Carno, a mechanical digger was brought in to recover equipment buried in the well. The car came into the yard and out came four persons, four police officers, and they commandeered a JCB to dig the well out. That's what we were told. Operation Julie had grown to be the biggest drugs bust ever, domestically and internationally. Seizures were occurring absolutely all over the world. The Americas, Australia, New Zealand, all over Europe, the Far East, you name it, LSD was found there. There was also a raid on a mansion in the Dordogne region of France that Dai had been invited to attend. Armed with un petit peu of French from Whitland Grammar School, Dai found himself on the front line. A Welshman on the premises was refusing to cooperate. The French officer in charge turned to Dai. He simply asked me to have a word with this particular person who was in the house. So I went to him and I spoke to him in Welsh and I said to him, Boreda Machini, do you remember what he meant, Rubelvanin? Which, you know, good morning, my son, I think you're in trouble here. At which point he was completely astounded and flabbergasted to uh, be met by uh, a Welsh speaking person in that part of France. The Welshman cooperated with the police and led them to some interesting paperwork. They were financial documents that proved that the LSD business had become immense. There were money exchanging documents from all over the world. There were details of French and Swiss bank accounts along with stocks and shares. The net had finally closed on the biggest drug distribution network the UK had ever seen. 
A year later in Bristol Crown Court, the police eventually had the gang of 17 in the dock. It took a month to go through the details of the case. Kemp, as did most of the gang, pleaded guilty to the main charge of conspiracy to manufacture and produce LSD and was sentenced to 13 years in jail. His girlfriend, Christine Bott, got nine years. The relationship didn't survive the separation, though they are both currently believed to be in the UK. Alston Frederick Hughes got eight years and on his release promptly disappeared. Rumour has it that he is currently a long way from Chandewi Brevi in India. Whilst it was proved that his friend Buzz Paul Healy was not part of the LSD ring, he had simply driven Hughes from place to place. He was sentenced, however, to one year in prison for the possession of cannabis. In total, the gang was sentenced to over 120 years in prison. But what was the effect on the LSD trade? After the, um, the seizure of the LSD, the price of the tablets had gone up from, they were one pound before the raids, and then it escalated then to five pound a tablet due to the scarcity. It obviously took out some 90% of the British market of LSD. It didn't stop LSD completely, but it took out one of the biggest drug distribution networks that this country has ever seen in relation to any form of drugs. Operation Julie took out 13 million LSD tablets, then worth 100 million pounds, and many wanted to build on its success. The unfortunate side of it was that when the Operation Julie team was disbanded as such, there was still a lot of work which we could have continued to do. But this wasn't to be, and most of the officers were returned to normal duties. Many couldn't cope with the regime that they returned to. Um, they'd had, during that time they were on Julie, a certain amount of freedom. Many senior officers in forces used to say, jokingly, right, you've had your holiday now away with Operation Julie, now it's back to day-to-day -day police work. Dick Lee, the man who'd created and led Operation Julie, left the force. He wrote a popular book on the case and later became a private investigator. He has sadly passed away but the success of Operation Julie will always be a memorial to him. Today, one hears much less about LSD, but the fact that such a quiet, secluded part of Wales played such a major role in drug history still amazes many. To think that uh, LSD was being produced here under our very noses and making its way all over the world. The Welsh LSD production chain even surprised one of the world's most renowned international drug traffickers. When I heard about it, I, I mean, I actually felt sort of dismayed that I knew nothing about it. I mean, I was trying to be the biggest dope dealer in the world. I didn't suddenly want to be overtaken by a bunch of guys from over the hill. You know? <laughs> Today, people still romanticise about what happened to the money. Well, if the cash is, is stacked in the hills, I haven't found it yet, but I can do with it. But <laughs> about the drugs, no, I don't think nobody would want to see it. Whilst others simply remember the case with pride. Looking back at it now, I feel very proud of being one of the team and also being that 11 police forces were involved and that we all worked uh, together. But for one nostalgic journalist, Julie was a missed opportunity. Unfortunately, I didn't make much money out of it because it broke all over the world at the same time. Made headlines worldwide and you're talking about the biggest drugs bust in history at the time. It was massive. Yeah.